<laughs> good afternoon or good morning for those who are in the US and, and good evening for those who are in India. And, and welcome to this panel discussion that we have uh, entitled uh, India as a strategic actor in the Indo-Pacific perspectives from US, UK, Europe, and, and Russia. Uh, of course, now UK is not part of Europe anymore, so we have to differentiate both. Uh, this is, of course, a very topical um, issue. And uh, we know that many countries have different views, different definitions of, of the Indo-Pacific. We, we have entered an era when you have varieties of Indo-Pacific. Um, and uh, of course, within these varieties, of um, and various views of the Indo-Pacific, the way different countries look at India within their Indo-Pacific strategy also uh, varies. And this is exactly what we are going to explore today in a very rich panel, the very dense panel, and I will minimize my introduction to make sure that the presenters, the panelists have enough time for presenting their views. So I will briefly introduce them all and, and they will present their views in, in the same order. Uh, Cleo Pascal, first, welcome uh, to this panel. He's an associate fellow in the Environment and Society Program and the Asia Pacific Program. She is research lead on Chatham House's project on perception of strategic shifts in the Indo Pacific. And that's from the point of view of the US, the UK, India, Japan, Oceania, and France. So you, you will, you will present only one case study, but you could, of course, uh, and I will, and you will, of course, uh, um, comment upon others. Uh, Gary Mohan will speak after uh, Cleo, and, and that will be, and, uh, and she is, of course, as uh, we all know, a non resident fellow with the uh, Global Public Policy Institute in Berlin, and uh, a fellow with the Asia program at the GMF, the German Marshall Front, where she leads the India portfolio. And before that, um, Garima was a research fellow at the GPPI, leading the Institute's work on the global order and focused on the foreign and secret policy of rising powers, including India and China. And China, of course, will be today, like always when we speak about Indo-Pacific, the elephant in the world. And Natasha, Dr. Natasha Court, will uh, speak uh, in, uh, afterwards. Uh, she is a lecturer in international peace and security in the Department of War Studies at King's College. And after gaining a BA first class honors in Russian and German language and literature, uh, she followed an MA in Soviet studies at the School of Slavonic and East European Studies at uh, University of London. So she spent several years in publishing before opening a PhD at UCL on Russian policy towards China and Russia and China and, and Japan, sorry. And uh, we will definitely uh, learn a lot from her after the very interesting visit that uh, Putin paid to India a few weeks ago. And the way India tries to bring Russia in the Indo-Pacific is definitely an interesting uh, scenario. Last but not least, Tanvi Madan will present the uh, Indo-Pacific's uh, role of India from the American point of view. She is a fellow in the Project Initial Order and Strategy in the Foreign Policy Program and director of the India Project at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C., where she is speaking from. She explores India's role in the world and its foreign policy, as many of us do know, and she focuses in particular on India's relation with China and the U.S., she has published recently a fabulous, um, you can say, analysis of this triangle, uh, India, China, and the US with the bookings. So the floor is yours, and uh, we will listen to you um, for one hour, not more, because we need half an hour for the Q&A. So it means that. I will really make sure that you speak, each of you, for something like 15 minutes. And uh, then we'll have uh, more questions, for sure. Uh, you may ask 
questions to, to each other. And of course, I will also uh, moderate uh, this panel discussion, which means that you can, those who are uh, listening to us at the moment, uh, send your question in the Q&A box as usual, and I'll um, organize them in such a way that we'll have uh, the most, the less disordered conversation we can. Cleo, the floor is yours for the first uh, presentation. Merci Christophe, and thank you to Vignesh and to Kings for, for hosting us for, for this very important and timely event. As the first question has said, uh, it's budget day today, so um, things, are, things are definitely getting interesting in, uh, in India, and, and everybody's trying to figure out how to work, work themselves into, uh, into those changes. Um, I'm, I'm going to give you a quick overview of the project. There, there is the UK focus, obviously, but the UK is part of, uh, it's, it's India and Indo-Pacific policy is changing uh, qu quite dramatically along with everybody else's and in reaction to uh, everybody else's as well. So looking at it in isolation may not give as complete uh, an idea. So I'll tell you a little bit about this project, this uh, uh, perceptions project that we ran for a couple of years. There are three um, timelines to it. One was the, the field research that we did from September 19th to March 2020. So uh, I flew out of Japan in March 2020. So that it was very much a picture of what the world was like before COVID. And then, um, then we followed up for the next year, what happened after COVID. And then uh, after that, we've, I've followed up on my own afterwards about how it's changed over the past year. Um, the idea was to understand how these seven countries looked at each other and how they were reacting to each other. And we did it in partnership with think tanks in each of the countries. So in India, our partner think tank was Gateway Host. Um, in China, we the interviews were done face to face. Uh, we interviewed about 200 experts uh, in all and um, gave a standardized set of surveys to all of the countries. And the way that we did it was we asked in each country. So for example, at the Chatham House Roundtable, uh, we, we brought together, it was a closed door Chatham House rule um, uh, roundtable with people from a wide range of policymaking communities. And we asked how they thought the relationship between their country and the other seven countries would change over the next five years. Uh, and we did the same thing in India. So for example, in India, we asked about their India-US relationship, India-UK relationship, India-France, India-Oceania, and Japan, and then saw where they matched up and, and where they didn't match up. And what we found, uh, so this is this before COVID period, was uh, the trend through all of them, and this was very evident in the UK, was there were, there were three things that we kept seeing. One was there were uh, enormous domestic divisions about how to handle China between the political and economic communities and the defense strategic and intelligence communities. So the political and economic communities tended to want more engagement with China and the defense intelligence strategic communities were much more cautious. At the same time, all of them were saying that we were in a period of foresight uncertainty that was um, more difficult than many had seen since the end of World War II. Um, Brexit was happening. There was uh, the U.S. elections were coming up. There were people didn't quite know what direction their partners and allies were heading in. Um, and at the same time, they had the internal divisions, and that led us to our to the third finding, which was well, there was a lot of hedging. A lot of people were holding back on making decisions that they they didn't they, if they didn't have to make them. Um, I'll give you just an example of the findings we had because our topic is India. I know we're kind of looking into India, but this is what we found from India looking out, and um, that we did it in Mumbai because we wanted to have a combination of both the Navy point of view and the business sector point of view. Um, so from the, the India-UK relationship, from the India perspective, uh, was not great. Um, you know, they, they compared it, for example, to the relationship they had with France, uh, which they saw as being uh, much stronger and deeper. They, you know, there were a lot of references to uh, kind of the French-India space cooperation that went back to the 60s. Um, the c complaints about the UK not sharing um, high tech, but there are also interesting kind of specific things like the fact that they wanted to develop a merchant fleet, but the insurance sector based out of London wasn't facilitating that. In fact, it was making it quite difficult. 
Um, so in, in, in many different sectors, the UK was seeing as not being as participatory as it might be. Um, and on the UK side, the UK itself at that time was, uh, we had in, in that round table, there was a real divide between those who uh, came from the foreign policy community who were trying, who were basically saying, you know, we're middle power and maybe we should just be doing diplomacy and peacekeeping and that kind of stuff. And those who came from the defense uh, community who wanted to take a much more um, uh, kind of forceful or present place on the world stage. So we could see that there was kind of a, uh, at that point, the UK didn't really know where it was heading and India wasn't particularly delighted with the way things were heading. Um, just quickly, because, because we're gonna be talking about it, uh, the India-France relationship was perceived as quite strong on both sides. Uh, the India-Japan relationship was perceived as, as very strong on both sides. The uh, India-US relationship was very strong on the US side on defense. Um, and on the Indian side, there was growing interest, but continued concern about US consistency. And I'm sure Tanvi will talk about this much more in depth and much better than I will. Uh, in terms of Oceania, and this is kind of uh, relevant, um, there was a very strong desire in Oceania for more Indian engagement. Um, the MEA did put in place a Pacific Islands post and they have contributed, just announced just recently $200,000 for Tonga, which I think is probably something that might not have happened before. Uh, so that was a growing vector. All of this was happening, obviously, at that, even at that time in the context of China. And um, just, just to give you an idea of some of, the, some of the things that we were getting out of China in terms of their perceptions of how things were going, um, one of the things that we asked all the countries uh, was, uh, whether they thought what they thought the likelihood of a kinetic conflict happening in the Indo-Pacific by 2024 was, in the UK it was practically nothing. A very very few thought that the likelihood of a kinetic conflict by 2024 was likely. Uh, in the case of China, everybody, every respondent said it was likely. The only question was whether it would be small or whether it would be larger. Similarly, um, one of the other questions we asked was whether the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea um, would, uh, would still be in force um, by 2024. And again, in the UK, uh, where, where there was a lot of uh, effort put into creating it, uh, there was no question that it would still be in force. In, in China, again, none of them thought it would. The foreign policy people, uh, thought it could be adjusted, and the defense people thought it would be ignored by and large. The, the details are in the report if you're interested in the numbers. And then the, the other factor was uh, in China, um, uh, many in Beijing saw uh, China becoming a major HADR player, which is a, a, a way to deploy across the Indo-Pacific. And we've seen that now in the Solomons with the police going to the Solomons and with the Tonga recovery. So this was, the, this was that kind of environment that was happening before COVID, and then COVID happened. And then we started to see the moves on Hong Kong, and then we saw Galwan. And Galwan was extremely important for shaping uh, Indian, in that, that, that fracture that we had between the, the economic and political community and the defense intelligence and security community in India after Galwan, the defense security intelligence community became uh, much more involved in shaping policy. And we saw it with, you know, within two weeks, they had banned Chinese apps. And, and part of that was a, a much greater willingness within India to um, sign on to um, many more deals. I'm jumping ahead, but, you know, for example, uh, just a couple of days ago, the first stage of the UK India FTA negotiations concluded. That may not have been something that had moved so quickly had not COVID happened and had not Galwan happened. So we're starting to see, um, you know, that 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 effect come into play and and sort of just to kind of uh, uh, con conclude or close up. So what we've had, what we've seen, and this has been very evident in the UK, is that transition through COVID and continuing out the other side is that the domestic divisions in many countries have um, resolved to a more defense security intelligence view of China, 
which means that there's much more interest in India. And we've seen that uh, we've seen that very clearly in the UK. I mean, the UK overtures to to uh, to India are are now there. It's not an unbumpy road. There's still a lot of problems that we saw problems with vaccines. We've seen problems with visas, all that sort of stuff. But that momentum is growing. We see it obviously with Australia. We see it um, obviously with the U.S. and with other partners. And and you know there was the, the UK was was. Uh, you know, originally when the Quad was coming together, originally there was an idea of whether the UK would be involved or not, and the UK just didn't show up to the meeting. Now that would be a very, very different case. So, um, so that domestic division is kind of clear. And in terms of uncertainty, you know, the the big things have happened. Brexit has happened. The US has had the election. That sort of uncertainty has receded. And so we're seeing actually a little bit less hedging. We're seeing the UK taking a stand on 5G, um, all that sort of stuff. So right now, um, especially around defense and economic issues, as people try, as nations try to figure out how to handle uh, China, um, India becomes much more interesting as a alliance partner, as a defense partner, intelligence partner, particularly also, but also as an economic partner. So you see the quad get rejuvenated. You see the logistics agreements come in. You see things like BECA with the US, um, you know, the India, Japan, Australia supply chain resilience initiative. Um, when AUKUS fell apart, of course, or happened, Macron called Modi immediately <laughs> to try to uh, cement that thing. So we're, we're seeing that, that, that desire to engage with India um, grow. India, as I'm sure we'll hear, especially around the Russia thing, has its own uh, issues and decisions to make on it. Uh, but from a UK side, um, once they start to clear away some of the China lobby in London and, and uh, some of the Wahhabi Lond wa lobby in London, which is also an issue, um, you're starting to see much more of a trend heading towards India. So this, um, this uh, vector that has gone from uh, a lot of uncertainty before COVID to a scramble during COVID now seems to have settled into play. And uh, it's gonna be quite interesting going forward. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cleo. You have already uh, put the UK-India relations in perspective, uh, comparing uh, UK and France, for instance, with uh, India. And we will continue in the same direction because Garima will uh, explore European trajectories as well now. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be on this panel, particularly with these formidable panelists. Such an honor to be a part of this group. Um, I will talk about the European Indo-Pacific strategies and how they've reflected changing positions of India, focusing um, on France, Germany, Netherlands, the three countries that have their own Indo-Pacific strategies and the EU, which came out with a collective one last September. And I think these strategies really reflect really well how differently these countries have started looking at India as a partner. But one can argue that India's position has been changing even before these strategies. And I'll make that point as I talk through each one of them. Um, when we look at the national strategies, it's important to remember that they reflect national priorities and national political attitudes. Therefore, it's only natural that each country would look at India differently. France looks at India very differently given the historical context of the France-India partnership that Cleo has mentioned. It's, uh, the partnership exists way longer uh, then, for example, Germany and India, and also Netherlands and India. So, of course, there's, there, there are subtle differences in, in how these countries have been looking at, uh, at the country. Now, France and India, not only do they have a long-lasting strategic partnership, but within the context of the Indo-Pacific outlooks of both, they have been coordinating much more um, at the bilateral level. Um, at the level of trilaterals, and one can only hope the France-India-UK trilateral will get back on track now that we see some of the dust settling down from AUKUS, but also in terms of coordinating regional goals, particularly in the Indian Ocean, 
when it comes to organizations like the Indian Ocean Rim Association, where France recently upgraded from being a dialogue partner to a partner, uh, to a member, and the membership was supported by India, to other goals in the Indian Ocean region, particularly where India and France have a lot to talk about and coordinate. I think that it's a different level and deepening of the strengthening of um, the strategic partnership we see in the India-France case. Um, and then I think for, for Germany as well, the, the abstract to this talk mentions that um, Germany, the German um, policy guidelines on the Indo-Pacific mention ASEAN as, as an important partner. Here, I think I'd like to caution that when we look at these documents, they're important indicators of what these countries want to achieve, but they're not you know, the be all end all. They're just guidelines for governments to interpret them. And we are already seeing the new German government take a very different approach and attitude towards India than say uh, the previous one under Chancellor Merkel. Um, the coalition agreement of the new German government has a whole paragraph on the Indo-Pacific and the importance of the region for Germany, but it also specifically mentions the need to revitalize the strategic partnership with India. It admits that Germany has not made use of this partnership, which has been, of course, established as long as the French one, uh, but has not been capitalized on so far. And the government wants to change that. Of course, we saw that come into action with the port visit of the German frigate Bayern, which uh, made a stop in Mumbai and came into the news for all the wrong reasons. But if we go beyond the comments made uh, by, by the Vice Admiral, it did open channels of communication which have not existed in the, in the Germany-India partnership before. The dialogue and exchanges between navies, uh, the, the, the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative on the Indian side, new channels of communication between the two bureaucracies, uh, particularly concerning the maritime domain, which have been uh, not really explored in the German-India partnership. That's, uh, that's, I think it's an interesting first step and should not be discounted no matter where we stand on the, on the remarks of the, of the Admiral. Um, and of course, one interesting thing that just came out a couple of days ago is the priorities under the chancellorship um, of Olaf Scholz. Now, it says that uh, the chancellor's priorities in the first half of 2022 will be to strengthen partnerships with democratic partners in the Indo-Pacific, um, including India. And uh, we also heard reports that the chancellery wants to um, conduct government to government consultations with Tokyo and if possible, New Delhi before doing so with Beijing. Now that is a very different attitude of the chancellery that we saw under Chancellor Merkel, for example, um, who had the maximum number of trips in the region to China, had really invested in the China partnership when it came to Germany's Asia policy, if you can call it as such. It was mostly China and interactions with ASEAN. And now we see that really changing with the Germany-Japan uh, 2 plus 2 dialogue, for example, and a new outreach towards India. And, and that is really being also reciprocated from the Indian side. Um, and we are seeing more and more interesting statements from the MEA, for example, welcoming Europe in the region, saying that Europe has a role to play, uh, that dynamics in the Indo-Pacific will have an implication for, for the EU. I think that's that's an interesting change of tone than even a few years ago when the EU was really struggling to get India to participate in, in Atalanta, for example. Um, we, we, that's a market shift in tone from, from both sides. But I think the most important part is to look at the EU-India partnership uh, more broadly. And that has really changed since 2018, uh, much before the EU released its Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, when the EU came up with the famous or infamous um, characterization of the Chinese partnership, this partner competitor rival, what is less known is that around that time, the EU also released a new strategy on India that uses fundamentally different language to recast the partnership with India, going from economic partnership, development aid, values, et cetera, which was 
the mainstay of the partnership in the past to this watershed moment in 2018, when the EU talks of India as an important pillar in a multipolar Asia, a key geopolitical partner for the EU, and really recasts the partnership in the terms of geopolitics, uh, security cooperation, political cooperation, and not just the legs of trade and economics, which had for a long time been the mainstay of the partnership. Um, I think that's quite important to note, and this is why, as the EU was going through the process of writing its Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, the historic Porto summit took place last year, which was the first time all 27 EU heads of state met with an Indian prime minister, and we saw some important initiatives come out of that, both in terms of institutionalizing the partnership and broadening the base of the EU-India partnership. We had the connectivity agreement, which is a mainstay of the EU's Indo-Pacific strategy, et cetera. Um, and then, of course, that was followed today, for example, the second uh, EU-India maritime security dialogue took place. Uh, we saw joint naval exercises in the Gulf of Aden earlier this year. It's, it's all of these activities sort of uh, lend a new depth and uh, institutional depth to the partnership that was missing before. And one can argue that this is because of the EU's changing orientation, even before it officially adopted the Indo-Pacific framing, uh, much more of, on the understanding that China cannot be the only partner you work with in the region and, and you need to work with other partners, India clearly being important. Um, and I'll end with the final anecdote with the France's EU presidency, of course, on the 22nd of February, we'll see a ministerial forum, which uh, France wants to use to give some meat on the bones of the EU Indo-Pacific strategy. Let's not forget, this is being hosted by Paris, but it is an EU-wide summit. It would be led by uh, HRVP Borel. And uh, the summit will come out with concrete projects and initiatives, um, including a lot with India. Uh, so again, we see more and more, it's not just rhetoric, it's not just on paper, but actually in the day-to-day -day conduct um, and, and the level of the bureaucracies working together, um, you know, projects being implemented, the nature of the partnership with India is changing. Again, with the caveat that this won't not be, uh, you know, a smooth road, and of course there will be bumps, uh, FTA being one of them and the negotiations which have been restarted, but I don't think any meetings have taken place with, with Brussels yet um, on the topic. But I think even just in the terms of the menu of things that we're talking, um, New Delhi and Brussels and New Delhi and Berlin are talking about has expanded uh, significantly um, given the focus on the Indo-Pacific. Thanks. Thank you very much, Garima, for updating us, uh, well, not only on this, convergence between Europeans and India, but also on the convergence within European countries, among European countries. And, and indeed, there is a shift on the German side that is noticeable on the, uh, to use the categories Cleo was, was using, we, we, we see a shift from, uh, well, uh, economic milieus towards security oriented um, milieus in the sense of the center of gravity is, is probably uh, moving. And that's a very, important uh, factor uh, already to mind by China, of course, uh, again. Great. So we are now turning to, to Natasha for um, hearing from her. Uh, well, what is the um, role of uh, Russia in this uh, arrangement? And, and, the, and of course, the last visit of Putin I was mentioning uh, made, made this question even more pressing. Natasha, the floor is yours. Thank you again for inviting me. Um, yeah, I mean, um, Russia has a very, um, let's say, conflicted approach, I think, to the Indo-Pacific. Um, it, it actually um, already, it contests the term. It doesn't believe that such a thing really should exist. Um, and um, Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, has time and again um, described the Indo-Pacific concept as a destructive concept um, and an artificially imposed construct 
Um, and uh, he said, we prefer to call it the Asia Pacific region. Um, and it was quite interesting that I think there was um, a discussion uh, last year um, between um, Lavrov and I think it was the Indian foreign minister. There wasn't, there was meant to be um, a visit um, last year by Putin, I believe, to India, which was cancelled ostensibly due to COVID. But then, you know, I think some people, especially in India, suspected that it was more to do with Russian hostility towards India's role in the Indo-Pacific. And I think the Indian foreign minister at the time actually kind of contested Lavrov's um, kind of description, if you like, uh, conceptualization of the Indo-Pacific um, and suggested that Asia Pacific was a very colonial kind of description itself. So there's this kind of endless contestation, if you like, of the term. Um, and, you know, so for Russia, um, the Indo-Pacific is really viewed very much, it is viewed very often through the lens of, of China because it believes that the US is seeing it through the lens of China. Um, it sees the US conceptualization of the Indo-Pacific as being about containing China. Um, and, um, you know, specifically under Trump, but I don't think that it has changed particularly, um, you know, with Biden either. Um, and obviously, you know, there's also um, the sense in which, um, you know, this whole idea of the Indo-Pacific as a maritime commons and the Indo-Pacific also as a kind of um, rules-based order rather than being based on international law is something that Russia really pushes back against. Um, at this point, it might be a good idea for me just to give a really brief outline of um, sort of Russia's policy towards Asia in general. Um, so um, obviously Russia does have a very long border with China um, and it of course has uh, very good relations with China uh, these days. Um, but you know, it wasn't always necessarily inevitable if you like. So with the fall of the Soviet Union and so on, you know, there was actually quite a big constituency within the Russian kind of foreign policy elite at the time that, you know, Russia should really partner with Japan because Japan was the more advanced economy. It was part of the G7, you know, and at the time, you know, it seems hard to believe now, but at the time, you know, Russia very much saw itself partnering with Europe, the US, upholding human rights and so on. And so China, you know, wasn't really um, viewed in that kind of, in that dimension. Um, but, you know, if you like, life got in the way, Russia and China had to demarcate their border, which had, was a process that had already begun under Gorbachev. And so that process kind of helped, I think, partly to institutionalize relations between the two, the opening up of the border, economic trade and so on, kind of almost partly organically began. But then at a certain point, it was realized that also there was a very good um, arms trade to be had with China. You know, they single-handedly attributed the rejuvenation of the Russian defense industry to um, these weapons sales to China and so on. And, um, and so, you know, Japan kind of really um, sort of um, didn't really, was kind of downgraded essentially in Russia's Asia policy. Um, but, you know, over the years, of course, India has always, um, has remained really, um, if not at the top of Russia's kind of agenda, it's always um, been quite consistently um, there. Um, I think relations have gone through quite a few um, setbacks um, and have been really in the doldrums at various points in time. And I think even now there's a kind of, you know, some people like Dmitry Trenin, who's at the Carnegie Center in Moscow say, well, you know, India can't really compare to China um, for Russia in terms of um, economic trade. And that's certainly true. Um, I'd say India's, um, the trade turnover between Russia and India is about a tenth of the trade turnover between Russia and China, for example. Um, but then when you look at weapons trade, for example, um, obviously we had the um, kind of furore, if you want to call it that, over the sale of the S-400s to India, um, and that um, is, going to, is going ahead. Um, interestingly, despite, you know, the US threatening to impose those sanctions and so on, although I think the US concluded in the end that perhaps it wasn't as 
um, dangerous for the US as it had kind of originally uh, posited. Um, so there's a kind of sense in which India, although relations have not um, been on a level that, you know, Russia-India relations are not on the same level as relations with China. They have um, this uh, privileged strategic partnership. I mean, you know, these words are always um, a bit kind of um, slippery, if you like, you know, then with China, it has, Russia has a strategic flexible partnership, you know, with a view to maybe upgrading it to this, at a later point, Russia and China, you know, potentially have an alliance and so on. But I think there are ways in which Russia and India um, do have um, sort of, if you like, core interests and actually see eye to eye on a certain on certain issues. Although obviously there's been the kind of um, the sort of suspicion, if you like, of India when it's been kind of positioned by the US. Perhaps not so much now, but certainly initially, I think it was very much positioned by the US as this kind of you know linchpin of democracy in the Indo-Pacific very much kind of against China, if you like. Um, and so Russia has, has, has not liked that at all. Um, but at the same time, there are many areas, I think, where, where, they, where Russia feels it can work with India and where it can perhaps even, and perhaps also dilute China to some extent. So if you look at, for example, in Central Asia, of course, India and Pakistan are now members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. India is taking, on um, a bigger role um, in Central Asia, having just held a summit with the Central Asian countries and so on. Um, and if you, you know, then you look at um, the kind of compact, which is at the center of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and it's a very different compact to the compact, which is at the center of Indo-Pacific, arguably. It doesn't talk about values, it talks about combating the three evils of terrorism, fundamentalism, and separatism. Um, and actually, when you start looking into it, um, Russia and India have, you know, very often um, provided each other with a kind of mutual sort of recognition, understanding of each other's problems, if you like, with separatism and so on within their respective entities. Um, so if you think about Kashmir, you know, Russia has shown understanding for India's position on uh, revocation of Kashmir's autonomy. Um, and um, India has also shown understanding in the past for Russia's position on Chechnya, for example. Um, on Ukraine, um, I'm not suggesting that India has um, supported the annexation of Ukraine, but it has taken a slightly different position, a much more neutral position on it um, than one might have expected. Um, and also, um, of course, with this whole issue at the moment uh, regarding Ukraine, Russia be having the presidency of the UN Security Council um, and opposing, you know, this open meeting in the Security Council on to discuss Ukraine. Um, of course, Russia and Ukraine voting against it. India has abstained on that, but it hasn't actually supported, um, you know, um, it hasn't actually come out against such a meeting. So there are many ways I think in which Russia and India um, perhaps have more commonalities than what one might expect. I would also point to, you know, um, obviously India, India's identity is very much, you know, the world's biggest parliamentary democracy and so on. Um, but actually it's also a member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, um, you know, it, shared some similar views on, on Libya and the intervention there, um, which of course it was not in favor of. So while I'm not suggesting that Russia and India are completely aligned in this way, I think they, they have both also within the BRICS as well, um, kind of suggested that, you know, um, there should be a much more multipolar world, um, you know, that power should be distributed more equally and so on. So even if it's only symbolic, I think it's quite helpful to Russia to kind of position itself alongside India um, in this way. Um, and regarding the Indo-Pacific, um, you know, clearly so far, um, you know, there hasn't really been interaction between Russia and India in the Indo-Pacific. You know, it's much more likely, if you like, to take place um, in, in Eurasia, you know, the, on, on, on a continental kind of in a continental sense. 
Um, but Russia has this idea about a greater Eurasia where it, um, you know, bring where you bring together the Eurasian Economic Union, um, you know, within Central Asia and uh, with Central Asia and, and Belarus and so on. I um, mean, you kind of connect that to um, Asia Pacific and in fact now to the Indo-Pacific. Um, and some of this may be more about kind of, you know, Russia comforting itself with certain geopolitical imaginaries, but, you know, for the kind of, in a discursive sense, if you like, um, that kind of helps uh, Russia, if you like, to um, kind of work its way through these things. Um, and India has um, also kind of, although it's fairly small scale, it has shown some kind of appreciation, if you like, of Russia's kind of dilemma as well. Um, I think um, by making statements suggesting, um, you know, that Russia is somehow important um, in the Indo-Pacific. Um, and of course, India has also said that it, it opposes block politics, block policies, containment policies um, in the Indo-Pacific, because um, clearly India is also wary of being drawn into um, containment strategies that look very clearly focused on China. So although, of course, India does have that very ambivalent, difficult relationship with China, at the same time, I think, you know, Russia, of course, also, while it does have this very close relationship with China, um, is, I think, still, it may not be explicit and obvious, but it clearly still would like uh, to maintain some room for manoeuvre, right? Um, so if it completely hitches its wagon to China, um, you know, that manoeuvre is really lost, that room for manoeuvre um, is lost. So, so I think India um, is certainly um, helpful to Russia um, in that respect, you know, maintaining some room for manoeuvre. Um, of course, what in Russia would like would be for India to return to its very clear position of non-alignment. Um, but for now, I think um, that Russia, um, you know, is trying to, to get India to invest in its Russian Far East, for example, because of course Russia does, um, you know, is on the Pacific there. Um, and Modi has kind of uh, played along with that to some extent by attending the Eastern, Eco Eastern Economic Forum, um, which is held in uh, which is held in September every year, and offering some credits um, to invest there. Um, and India has now talked about an Act Far East policy, um, you know, saying that it's in the future going to be helping to develop the Russian Far East, which for Russia is kind of has always been part of, you know, making a window on the Asia Pacific and kind of moving much more in that direction. Um, so developing that region for Russia has been very important, um, you know, because it's been a neglected region over the years. Um, so I think the fact that Modi is actually visiting, you know, this kind of very remote part of the Russian Far East, but which is the kind of outpost of Russia on the Pacific, even if only symbolically, um, kind of serves to sort of show um, that they're really um, making, he's really um, kind of making an effort, if you like, to sort of be inclusive vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia. Um, and of course, India has been trying to persuade Russia that Indo-Pacific is an inclusive idea rather than an exclusive one. Um, I think another area where the two might um, work together is on um, kind of and the last one, maybe. cooperation. Yeah, beefing up cooperation with ASEAN because Russia is, um, Russia is very supportive of um, increasing cooperation with ASEAN um, for kind of obvious reasons. You know, it wants to kind of refocus on ASEAN rather than, you know, this focus on the Indo-Pacific. I'll leave Thanks, it there. Thanks, That was really very useful. And the way uh, you describe Russian promotion of multilateral, multipolar world, in fact, as affinities with uh, the Indian policy uh, of plurilateralism, uh, clearly there, there are affinities which arc back to uh, well, a rejection of, uh, of, of the uh, division of the world uh, the way we used to know it. Well, from Russia to, to the US, uh, with India in the middle, uh, there is only one uh, one step that we are going to, to cross now, and uh, then we will now educate us on the uh, American view of India in the Indo-Pacific. 
Uh, thank you, Christoph, uh, and thank you to, to King's uh, India Institute, to Professor Tillon as well, and Vignesh. And I'm really pleased to be on this panel with Ms. Pascal, Dr. Kurt, and Dr. Mohan. Um, I'm going to just, you know, lay out uh, some aspects of the U.S. approach to the Indo-Pacific, how it's seen, particularly the Biden administration, where India fits in, uh, and look at some of the convergences and divergences kind of from India's perspective. Um, the Indo-Pacific is often seen as a U.S. idea, as uh, as Dr. Kurt said, you know, Foreign Minister Lavrov, uh, like uh, his Chinese counterpart, often portrayed as a U.S. idea. But the U.S. was actually a late adopter to this idea of the Indo-Pacific, especially compared uh, to Japan and Australia. It's only recently with the Trump and Biden administrations that you've seen them embrace both the, you know, the concept of a free and open Indo-Pacific um, as the other countries, uh, the, the other quad members had before it, including uh, India, they and 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 these the, both these administrations, the Trump and Biden administrations, have envisioned a key role for India in their strategy uh, for the Indo-Pacific. I would say, though, that if you think about it, both the idea of a reconnected Asia, a more integrated maritime region, and of India being a key node or pole. Uh, preceded uh, this Trump and Biden uh, embrace of the Indo-Pacific concept. Uh, the Bush administration, you started to see recognition uh, of this with Condoleezza Rice, for example, talking about needing to see India uh, in the context of an India-China dyad, not just uh, and moving beyond the kind of India-Pakistan hyphenation that the US uh, had had for decades. Uh, and you saw a range of kind of uh, uh, developments then, whether it was the first iteration of the Quad, uh, whether it was US-India bilateral ties, a defense framework agreement, the nuclear deal, and the next steps for strategic partnership that were driving towards this idea of India being connected with this larger uh, Asia. Uh, in the Obama administration as well, you heard, used to hear the term then, they wouldn't use the term Indo-Pacific, uh, but a very convoluted one, Indo-Asia Pacific. Uh, but you heard then Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter, talk about kind of a network of alliances and partnerships uh, in Asia, uh, which very much for the Obama administration as well included uh, India and uh, Secretary of State Clinton uh, at that time had talked about India, wanting to see India go from looking East to uh, acting East. You also saw the development of kind of various structures at that time, uh, India-US dialogue in Asia, uh, the US-India-Japan trilateral, the inclusion of uh, Japan as a, as a regular member in the US-India maritime exercise Malaba. And then you saw uh, what was quite remarkable that India signed on to this, a joint strategic vision uh, for Asia Pacific and the Indian Ocean region, which was signed in, in 2015. Um, the Trump administration initially didn't kind of embrace this Indo-Pacific idea. Uh, the focus initially was very much in China, North Korea, et cetera. But you did see a shift uh, by the summer of 2017, and particularly a series of speeches from Secretary of State Dillison, Secretary of Defense Mattis, and then President Trump himself embracing this uh, concept of the free and open Indo-Pacific, uh, renaming uh, the Pacific Command to the Indo-Pacific Command, reviving the quadrilateral, uh, each of which had a, a mention of India as a key, key part of the, the, the strategy. And what you really saw is, why did this embrace happen? It was reflecting a recognition of the realities in the ground, that what, what happens in one oceanic region does not stay in that oceanic region. Uh, and China, which objected, like Russia, to this concept, was really kind of its expanding footprint was making this a reality, uh, whatever you wanted to call it, a more integrated region. Uh, and you had seen uh, the interest of actors like Australia, India, and Japan that were US allies and partners who were operating outside uh, and had more interest in, uh, in areas outside their own interests. Uh, when Joe Biden won the 2020 election, there was some discussion that he'd revert to kind of this Asia Pacific uh, concept during the transition. Uh, you did see some references to Asia Pacific. There was some mention instead of free and open Indo-Pacific references to secure and prosperous uh, Indo-Pacific. But you've really seen in the first year of the Biden administration it persists with this concept in many aspects of the Indo-Pacific approach uh, as well. And in fact, it's doubled down on it. If you look at their document, their speeches, it's retained uh, you know, the Indo-Pacific command nomenclature. It's renamed, for example, in the Defense Department, the Indo-Pacific Security Affairs, not Asia Pacific anymore. And then within the National Security Council, 
uh, the position of the Indo-Pacific coordinator under which you now see China, Southeast Asia, Pacific, uh, and South Asia. Um, you also saw kind of in, in the first, uh, especially the first several months in office, the Biden administration really seeking to prioritize uh, this Indo-Pacific. Uh, 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 kind of region. And there's little doubt that, 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 you know, that it was seen not just as America often had traditionally Asia being the source of a lot of economic opportunity, but that you now saw a looming challenge. And there was little doubt that that challenge, uh, a rising China's assertive behavior and concern about its impact on the regional order have shaped that US focus and the Biden administration focus uh, on the Indo-Pacific. Uh, like the Trump administration, the Biden administration uh, has continued to identify China as a comp competitor. Uh, and this is underpinned by, uh, by kind of bipartisan support for this view on Capitol Hill. Um, and you've seen the administration see this competition not just as military, but diplomatic, economic, technological, and even ideological. And you particularly see that ideological values dimension in the president's own view, with President Biden repeatedly identifying this as a competition of systems, authoritarian versus democratic and needing to show that democracies uh, can, uh, can deliver. Um, you've seen a lot of continuity in approach. Uh, you've seen some tweaks uh, to the Trump approach and some changes. I'm gonna outline kind of four, uh, just highlight four elements of the uh, Biden approach to the Indo-Pacific and where kind of you see the convergences with India and why this actually suits India uh, quite well. I think first and foremost, you have seen this attempt to focus on the Indo-Pacific. You saw it. Uh, in the phone calls and the trips, both outgoing and incoming into the US, uh, into the various summits that were held. Um, so a big, big focus on East Asia, on India, and then kind of more recently on Southeast Asia as well. You also saw this kind of approach in functional areas, for, for example, in vaccine diplomacy. And you saw this in the kind of creation or doubling down on vehicles or platforms like the Quad or the new kind of AUKUS uh, agreement. Uh, the Quad Summit was the first multilateral summit, for example, that Biden hosted uh, back in March, and that was virtual. Um, second element of this is all this reflected that other aspect, that not a China first approach, but an Indo-Pacific or Asia first approach from which China policy uh, would flow. Now, there have been US-China interactions init initially to state the, you know, assess the state of play, uh, then on specific areas like climate change. And then, you know, to, to uh, as the administration kind of put it, uh, uh, have discussions to manage competition or de-risk it somewhat. But you'd see even there, ahead of US-China me uh, uh, meetings, you saw the administration briefing key allies and partners in the uh, Indo-Pacific uh, ahead of it. And that's part of kind of, because they want the, you know, these allies and partners on board, this intensifying competition that they see uh, with China. Uh, the third element you've really seen a focus on is the administration saying that to tackle, uh, and part of this approach to the Indo-Pacific, to tackle the China challenge, uh, it had to build a position of strength. Uh, and this entailed uh, one strengthening at home, and that meant recovery and rebuilding economic, uh, but also from the pandemic. And then the, the other thing was position of strength with allies and partners. Uh, so that was a, that's the kind of fourth key element of their approach, which is a desire to show up alliances and partners, partnerships, deeping bilaterals and minilaterals, uh, moving to complete basing agreements and building really kind of these like-minded coalitions and different uh, issue areas, understanding uh, that alliances aren't sufficient uh, and kind of you know, bilaterals aren't significant, uh, sufficient, but also existing regional organizations were ASEAN, like ASEAN, while important, uh, were not sufficient to deal with uh, uh, the, the challenges. And this is where the quadrilateral, the Australia, India, Japan, U.S. quadrilateral, which has been elevated now to the leaders level uh, summit, came in with a key uh, role uh, for India. Um, and then finally, I think another element, which I'll just mention briefly, was bringing in European allies and partners, which is not something the Trump administration uh, did as much. There were some other differences with the Trump administration that I can talk about, including uh, a much more kind of proactive stance at multilateral and regional organizations uh, to challenge uh, China in some domains, um, you know, also focus on climate change, global public health, et cetera. But where you did see one area of continuity across the board with the Trump administration was India playing a key role uh, uh, in, uh, in this Indo-Pacific strategy with more time in the first year uh, spent in office uh, under the Biden administration than any previous US administration 
in the past. And this has really been because India fits for Biden into num is, is relevant to a number of uh, Joe Biden's priorities, whether that's China, whether that's COVID, whether that's climate change, and whether that's in some of the crises that he's had to deal with. They see India as a capable and willing partner, and particularly like-minded on, on China in a way some allies are not. And so what you've really seen is bilateral and plurilateral uh, engagement uh, and much deeper engagement and more broader engagement that you saw across a range of issues during the Trump administration. But particularly, like in the Trump administration, you've seen progress in the defense and security space. Now, India likes this US focus on the Indo-Pacific. It also likes this broader framing and the inclusion of its partners in, in, in Europe and Southeast Asia you know, in, this, uh, in this kind of Biden framing. And the reason it likes it, this US focus, it brings additional resources uh, and ideally commits the US to the region. Uh, the US is important to India's own goals in the region, especially tackling uh, the China challenge, which for India, as we all know, has intensified in the last two years. And the US is crucial for India, both in terms of its uh, external and internal balancing uh, strategy vis-a-vis -vis China, not just building India's own capabilities, but helping shape a favorable balance of power uh, in the region, helping maintain a rules-based order in the region, uh, and helping offer alternatives in the region where India either has capacity or reputational constraints. Uh, the US has also been very helpful to India in terms of crisis assistance. Uh, and you've seen this in the crisis with China in the last in the last couple of years. Uh, and today, kind of because of this utility that you see uh, in that India has for the US and its own Indo-Pacific strategy, you've seen India take a fundamentally different view of US power and presence in the Indian Ocean region, where it has gone from saying, you know, the US should stay out to kind of welcoming it in, but also developments, you know, kind of welcoming developments like Quad, like AUKUS, like working uh, with India's uh, neighbors in South Asia, which earlier it said, you know, the US should not be doing. Uh, another kind of benefit for India has been is that this Indo-Pacific strategy and the focus has really reinforced uh, the importance of India of, in, in the US. It, it gives it a, a key role. Uh, you know, you, the, the Obama administration used to call it the linchpin, the Trump administration called it the anchor. And the quad in particular, so it's not just been bilateral focus, uh, you see this the quad and the emphasis on that, it's given India a voice on, on not just kind of quad related or China issues, but regional and global issues more broadly. And the US has also been including it in various kind of global and uh, regional and multilateral platforms in a way that it didn't in the past. Um, it's also kind of changed perceptions of India, which India likes, which is seen as more than just a South Asian, uh, South Asian uh, country. And it's helped it shape that broader discourse about the Indo-Pacific, for example, India was instrumental in the word inclusive being inclu you know, used as part of the free, open and inclusive uh, strategy that you see for the Quad. Um, and then the other benefit for India has been is kind of uh, this focus of, on the Indo-Pacific and the, uh, the, the kind of benefit or the, the role for India in it has meant the US has been more willing to manage differences with India, whether those are economic, whether that's on Iran or Russia, and whether it has been even on issues uh, at home, so some of the human rights and values questions uh, that both sides uh, have, uh, have uh, had friction on in the past. Um, so I think broadly the convergences you see for India, uh, it, uh, it has convergences on the kind of end goal in the Indo-Pacific, what it would like to see a free, open, inclusive, secure and prosperous Indo-Pacific where rules, uh, the rules-based order prevails, but it also has convergences with the US and what it doesn't want to see, a unipolar Asia dominated by China, uh, where there are kind of unilateral changes of status quo, a lack of uh, reciprocity in economic ties and lack of transparency, and the threat of use of, uh, uh, or use of force or co coercion. And so you do see convergences on that. You've also seen uh, Indian convergences on China being a challenge in the region, as well as you know, COVID and climate change and others. And I think you've seen agreement that existing mechanisms of hub and spoke alliance model or regional organizations are necessary but in, insufficient mechanisms. Um, so you do see kind of this huge set of convergences, which is why you are seeing uh, seeing this uh, this relationship drive forward. I'll finally end with just uh, mentioning very briefly uh, some of the divergences and the differences. I think one is you've heard a lot before, which is definitional. The idea, what how the countries define uh, Indo-Pacific, you know, what the geographic constraints are. I think personally, this is both overblown and can be managed, so I won't uh, say much. I think there are, you see some differences in how they define the principles, you know, what free means, 
Uh, for India, when it says free and open Indo-Pacific, it's more free being freedom for countries in the region to choose rather than whether they're democracies uh, or not. There are also kind of differences on you know, how you define freedom of navigation, et cetera. There are differences on priority, continental versus maritime, Taiwan versus, you know, for India, the China-India border issue matters more, Pakistan matters more than North Korea. Also differences in terms of who you think of as being partners. Uh, Russia, as Dr. Kurt noticed, seen as part of the kind of partnership. Uh, and then, you know, you do see uh, some of kind of uh, the sovereignty issues that India sees or the decolonization issues, such as the over Diego Garcia, the, thing, uh, the, um, uh, the base that the US has with the UK, uh, uh, making a difference. But I think the bigger challenges that I see, and this, I'll end with this, is how uh, India's concerns and then US concerns similarly about how India and the US will deal with various trade-offs, where to prioritize, Europe versus Asia. And we're seeing this with the Russia-Ukraine crisis. Uh, for India, it's Pakistan or China. You know, where, which areas to compete in, uh, how far, how intensely, in what areas to compete in China, and questions on strategy versus ideology, where they do have differences on alignment of values. And then finally, you know, there are questions, I think, uh, on domestic versus foreign policy, where both India and the US have this kind of move towards reshoring and things like that, which could affect, for example, uh, trade ties, which haven't been uh, as fast uh, uh, as usual. And I think the, the fundamental difference also, or questions that both sides have, a, about each other have to do with capabilities and commitment. Uh, how much uh, will they actually be on board uh, when rubber hits the road? Thank you so much, Tanvi, for this very comprehensive presentation and, and, and very clear uh, conclusions, um, even when uh, there are question marks. Um, we are going to return to these question marks precisely because we have uh, something like 25 minutes now for the Q&A. And I, I, I reiterate my invitation to uh, all the participants to, to ask questions in, in, in the box, uh, preferably the, the Q&A box, but I see people also using the chat. There are a couple of questions already before, before doing justice to them. Uh, I'd like to uh, just initiate the, um, a conversation by asking a, a question to each of you because some of the points you've raised uh, sometimes can be explore, uh, explored further. Uh, Cleo, there is one uh, question that I'd like to, to ask about, about lobbies. You, you mentioned the role of lobbies influencing the uh, British uh, foreign policy. Um, you mentioned the Wahhabi lobby, uh, and, and I would be very interested in in knowing what kind of role it plays, if any, in the UK-India relations, now that uh, Saudi Arabia is so close to uh, India. But more importantly, uh, the Pakistani lobby for many years has been one of the reasons why UK and India could, could not be as close as, as they could have been. What's left of this uh, force? Uh, is it now a spent force? Um, and yes, you can respond. Of course, you're right. <laughs> Let's have the conversation mode now. Um, so that, um, th th that is a very important question. The lobby question is a really important question. And, um, um, and, so, and, and there's a kind of a, an empirical reality and there's a perception issue. So, um, and when I, when, I talk, when I talk about India, there are obviously a lot of different Indias. And so the, the perception uh, of the India that I talk about is more the kind of the defense intelligence security community. And the perception of that community is that there is a Sino-Wahhabi lobby that is uh, extremely effective in a lot of different capitals, including in London. And so the, in that context, the, the Wahhabi tip of the spear might be the Pakistan lobby. So it's not necessarily linked directly to Saudi. It might have been much more associated with Saudi Arabia before, but now it might be. It now Qatar is obviously an element of it, but it's it's also uh, seen in in the context of Pakistan, and it's seen it's uh, seen as uh, there's a lot of Chinese money uh, pushing that agenda. So it might look like it's um, like it's. Pakistan elements or whatever, but uh, actually there's a lot of Chinese money and um, political warfare through social media 
to turbo boost it. So we we know that you know there, that that uh, China that there's sort of strategic um, units that have estimated by Professor Gary Shanick at tens of billions of dollars being dedicated to political warfare, uh, in, including on social media. Um, and that can go towards anything that would create a crack in the UK India relationship. And, and you know, India is, a, is in many ways an existential threat to China. So in two ways, I'll just finish with this. One is, you know, it's part of the justification for the Chinese Communist Party is that you need an authoritarian regime to govern a country of a billion people. Well, if you've got a country of a billion people next door that's doing just fine, then your, your legitimacy is questioned. The second is in terms of supply chains. You know, they don't want India to look like a viable redirection point for supply chains, which is why you ended up with what the Indian security community tends to think was a Chinese pushed attack on that iPhone Spark manufacturing plant in Bengaluru, um, you know, a, a while back, basically to get the, so so that that lobby is um, is very well funded and coming together for different reasons, uh, but it is a, an impediment, definitely still a very effective impediment to uh, to that relationship to the UK uh, India relationship. Very interesting. That's uh, something to explore more. Difficult to investigate, but clearly um, there is something there. Um, Garima, I wanted to, to return a little bit to the to the um, German uh, shift that you that you were describing. At least shift is too big a word, probably, but uh, you can say oh. process sub transformation. The question there for me is. Um, we all know that the German um, businessmen, uh, industrialists, uh, have invested a lot in China. Uh, China is the number one trade partner of Germany for now six years. How does this fit in a less accommodating policy vis-a-vis -vis China in the name of the Indo-Pacific and in the name possibly of a rapprochement with India? Do you see tensions within uh, different, I would say, power centers, um, and um, and the idea of decoupling that was not at all the cup of tea of the German in, in industry, is it percolating at the moment? And uh, this is the the question I would have to you and for you. And of course, if you can be brief, we'll have to, we'll do justice to other questions as well. Certainly, um, the the perception of the German industry is not a monolith. Um, when you look at the papers from BDI. The most critical papers on Germany's China policy were first issued by the German industry lobby. So it's, of course, the 10 big industries that have doubled down on China in the past, but uh, Germany and a lot of sort of small middle scale industries and a lot of, um, you know, overall the industry lobbies have been very critical. Even now the BDI released um, a very critical paper on China and wants the German government to take stronger action. So I think it is, one should not look at the, at the German industry as one big monolith. Of course, your second question as to the role of trade and economics um, will be an important one, even when it comes to the German-Indian partnership, because for a lot of industries looking to diversify, not decouple, again, very important not to use the term decoupling, because that's also not the end goal in many cases. So a lot of industries are looking at China plus one or diversification models, and they would like the opportunity to invest in India. There are right noises coming out of India, but of course, there's still a lot of reluctance. Um, and not uh, the, the image of India as it's not always, always easy to do business um, in spite of what the Indian government is putting out, these signals. Um, this, this is of course an issue, but I think it is, it is, it's different from uh, not wanting to leave China at all or, or you know, the, the language of decoupling, which a lot of people are not using. Um, can I also answer one of the questions mentioned in the chat? Um, again, this is comparing the German Indo-Pacific strategy and the EU one, and I would really like to urge people not to see them as 
uh, similar. Actually, the German strategy is very close to the ASEAN vision for Indo-Pacific in the sense that it does not want to take any positions. The EU paper is very different. Even if you read it, uh, the most important partners mentioned there are Japan, India, Australia, even South Korea. Uh, and you can even count the mentions of ASEAN vis-a-vis -vis these partners. It's also very different because it uses categorical language. For example, it says, we will cooperate with China, but push back when we have fundamental differences. Now, this is very different from the language used in any European member state EU Indo-Pacific strategies. I think that shift is important. And it's important not to see this as one sort of linear evolution of the German approach now that it's you know, superimposed on the Brussels one. I would say that Berlin is actually lagging behind on this as well, um, as well as the larger China question. Very interesting. And thank you for responding to Emal Tucker's question indeed. Uh, please feel free to, to do the same, but we'll turn to these questions um, for sure by the end. Uh, Natasha, just one clarification. When India thinks about the role of Russia in the Indo-Pacific, does it content itself with this Eastern Far Eastern part of uh, Russia on the Pacific, or is it inviting Russia for joint maneuvers in the Indian Ocean? You know, how far does this invitation go? Uh, if we know, I don't know if if if, if there is <laughs> easy response, any easy response to this question. Um. Yeah, sorry, I didn't quite um, get, you said, are they inviting them for joint? Yeah, joint maneuvers in the... Oh, uh... maneuvers. Um, <laughs> not, yeah, not that I know. Um, I mean, obviously, India has joined in with maneuvers with Russia in the context of, um, you know, the Shanghai, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, um, peace mission, as they're called. Um, but that's something a bit different. Um, I don't, can't really imagine that India would miss. I mean, that's, that's I mean, Russia and uh, Russia and China have obviously conducted joint patrols, bombing patrols, and so on in the Indo-Pacific, which have really antagonised um, Japan, South Korea, for example. Um, I mean, I suppose one can't rule it out, but then. Russia has really tried to, I mean, it's, it says it tries to remain uh, somehow impartial and neutral in the Indo-Pacific, but it seems as if it's been maybe moving away from that in the last year or so, like I said, with, these, with a kind of you know, step up in um, these patrols with China, uh, which are a bit provocative. Um, mm. So I don't, but I, I'm not sure what signal that would send to China if, um, if Russia and India were to, to carry out such maneuvers. Um, Very interesting. This is a red line, certainly. And last but not least, Anvi, uh, you mentioned, of course, Quad and AUKUS. Um, what kind of division of labor can these two minilateral represent for the US, of course, but for India, uh, if any? I mean, has it been already analyzed in these terms or, or, or not yet? Um, I think there hasn't been systematic analysis, but I do think there has been thinking in terms of, I think, where you'll see the division of labor. Uh, and I think the idea would be for this to be complementary, not, uh, you know, and, and working well together, which is in depth and emphasis. Um, and I think depth because with Australia, US, UK, uh, obviously two US allies, um, but also, you know, it's, as, as I think ma many have said today, it's not just about um, submarines, it is really about a broader advanced technology collaboration um, and, and kind of military uh, cooperation. And I think, you know, um, that is a, a, a level of depth, that, at least in a coalition setting, India is not willing to go to. In bilateral settings, yes. Um, that doesn't mean the Quad doesn't do, you know, you have sometimes people saying this is not a security uh, you know, partnership. Uh, but sometimes that's a distinction without a difference, because if you look at increasing exercises that India is doing bilaterally, trilaterally, 
in the Quad and the Quad Plus with these countries, it is fitting into this larger larger network. But I think, like I said, I think the Quad has a broader uh, broader kind of portfolio, um, which India likes uh, and the U Biden administration likes because it it directs less heat towards the Quad. And I think it, in in some ways, AUKUS has been useful because a lot of the criticism that used to go towards the Quad has now been directed against AUKUS, particularly in the region. Um, and so I think in some ways it's given the Quad some cover, but you can, I think you will see uh, over time, um, the Quad will, will, you know, some of the kind of security conversations, not just military, uh, cyber security, kind of, you know, uh, the strategic assessments of regional infrastructure projects and those kind of things uh, really develop. So I don't see them as contradictory. I don't think India does. I think there was a sense of trying to understand a little bit more about what AUKUS will do. Uh, you know, there were some traditional voices saying, oh, you know, this is going to mean more U.S. in the Indian Ocean. Um, I actually think the Indian government sees that as a positive. If this keeps the U.S. committed, uh, has a robust presence in the region, uh, then, that's a, then that's a good thing. It also means there might be less pressure on India, for, uh, for, on India to take kind of a more forward-leaning stance on issues like Taiwan, where, you know, AUKUS might be, at least the Australians might be kind of more willing and, uh, and relevant. Who would have imagined 20 years ago that India would have been so happy to see the US in the Indian Ocean? Hmm? 25 years ago, at least. Let's turn now to these uh, good, great questions we have uh, in the chat. Uh, Dietrich uh, Ritz asks, uh, how does this perceived repositioning towards India reconcile with the approach, Indian approach of making fair enemies, uh, as Jay Shankar says in his, in his book, where, where China keeps stopping the, its economic exchange volume with India despite the volatile situation. Does the economic, economics and other interest uh, perspective really diminish or are we just facing value polemics? Well, for those who are not familiar with um, Jay Shankar's book, The Indian Way, there is indeed in this book um, a, a, a definition of plurilateralism uh, that presents China still as a potential partner of, of, uh, of India, uh, and not only potential, but to some extent, an actual partner of India. So the question for, uh, for Dietrich, I suppose, is, um, and what if we were investing in an India that is still not on our side, quote unquote? Uh, any thought on this? I can jump in. I mean, I think, you know, the the other thing that there was in kind of external affairs minister Jay Shankar's book, uh, which he emphasizes was written in his personal capacity in a different time, but, uh, you know, he talks about, he uses the Mahabharata as an analogy. You know, one of the points he makes, which I think ha some have missed, is that you have to make choices. You can't sit on the fence because you've got to get dragged in uh, and you will be affected. And so you do have to kind of make choices. And that choice doesn't have to be kind of, you're gonna choose one side, but you find alignments. And when there are trade-offs, you make them. And you know, my perception of what's happened in the last uh, couple of years in particular is that um, China-India relations have fundamentally changed. Uh, the border has fundamentally changed. There is no going back uh, to where we were in early 2020. Uh, and that means India has whether it's deepening the quad, uh, which is a choice because it upsets Russia. And forget about China's kind of, will it provoke China? It upsets Russia. You know, as Dr. Kurt said, the, uh, Russians have been very vocal, in fact, more vocal than the Chinese about objecting to the quad. Uh, and it means deepening those ties. So that you, I think you have seen choices. And I think it's related to Dietrich's question, which is also related to a couple of questions on the budget and on economics, uh, which is there are also choices being made uh, on what India's uh, kind of economic future is. I think more should be made and I haven't had a chance to, to see the budget. But if you look at, for example, some of, yes, China, India trade numbers have gone up. Uh, but you know, if you look at, that's one number. If you actually compare it to US India trade or India's trade with a number of other countries, it's gone up even more in the last two years. So I think you have to compare. Second thing is what is, being, what is India importing? Uh, it, is, it is kind of inputs for increasing domestic manufacturing over time. And third, it's important to keep in mind that over the last two years, and this has been a trade off for India, India has imposed a range of extra scrutiny or restrictions on Chinese, particularly investments, uh, but activities in India in a range of sectors. And so investment is almost uh, dried up. 
Now, this was a choice because it could hurt India. It's been replaced by American, European, Japanese capital, but these are choices being made. But I think if I would have to, it, it goes to your anonymous attendee's comment, which is, you know, internal balancing will matter. India's internal capacity and capability will be crucial to how other countries see it. And therefore, it's not just about, you know, does India intend to manufacture at home, but does it have the sufficient strength to handle its own issues and play that larger role? You know, will it carry through forward with some of these free trade agreements? That's one of the things I'm watching this year. We've heard a lot of talk about re negotiation. Will they actually deliver? So, you know, the budget to me is important, not as much as what is in the defense and MEA budget. What does this say about what India's economy will do in the next uh, couple of years? Yes, you have indeed responded to a very important question uh, that was uh, indeed in the uh, Q&A box. Uh, and uh, it is directly related to the China question because uh, the economic strength that uh, India may or may not achieve will be a major factor uh, in the relations it can, it will be able to cultivate with, with, with China. By the way, regarding the budget, uh, there was another question in the, in the chat um, um, on this. There is one interesting figure that came out this morning about the um, kind of money India will disburse uh, in its neighborhood, which is definitely part of the uh, Indo-Pacific strategy of India. And it's less than last year. And it's a reflection also of the uh, fiscal problems that India is experiencing. Uh, inevitably, uh, with a budget deficit that is slightly above uh, what it should have been, and, and almost at 7%, and that's only for the center. Uh, if you factor in the, the states uh, and the PSUs, you have, you have a fiscal problem, and, and that has repercussions on the foreign policy inevitably. Let's turn for the last question to... Um, to the last one that has arrived in the uh, Q&A box. And uh, this has to do with another factor. Uh, we are shifting from the economics to the values. To what extent do evaluations of India's democracy slash democratic decline at all affect the attractiveness of India as a partner for US slash Europe slash UK? I'm sorry, Natasha, I will not ask you the question uh, because democracy is not a factor in the Russian foreign policy. It is supposed to be one still in the US, in UK and in, and, and in the EU. So if you don't mind, I will ask you the same question to, to the three of you. Does it matter? Does it matter at all? And if it does, to whom and to what extent? Gary Ma, Cleo, Tanvi, in that order? Sure, I can start. Um, yes, it does matter. Um, of course, for the EU-India partnership, uh, a criticism from the Indian side has been for a long time that the EU institutions, particularly the European Parliament, focuses a lot on, on human rights. Um, in the past few years, we've seen those resolutions actually decline in number. Uh, and the issues that European member states or the EU have uh, I mean, they are brought up, but they are brought up bilaterally rather than in the, in the form of public um, resolutions. And I think in a way that shows the depth of the partnership uh, and the maturity uh, that these issues can be brought up um, in the bilateral partnership. The EU-India Human Rights uh, Roundtable has also been revived um, after eight years. And of course, one can argue and question how useful this roundtable is and who are the actors sitting on the roundtable, but um, you know it is it is there and, and those talks are on. And so I, I do think that this is an issue, but this is not the only issue as it used to be in the past. And there are other sort of checks and balances also from the from the European side um, in the sense of uh, you know what matters in the India partnership. And it will matter more in the EU Parliament, probably, than anywhere else. Uh, so, this well, I, I just saw, um, you know, the the foreign policy, foreign um, and security committee, and others. They had put forth a few resolutions on on India, and I was kind of hoping to see the standard language on on sort of censure and 
um, criticism of, of uh, domestic developments, and I was surprised not to see them. Um, both cases, one on one was on trade, one was on the Indo-Pacific. Um, so I think even in the in the EU Parliament after the um, CAI agreement and the China issues, there's been a more, let's say, realistic or realist assessment of, um, <laughs> yes. of, of the role of India. Very interesting. Thank you, Cleo. So. The domestic situation in India side again. I'm going to talk about perceptions. Um, you know, there is a, there is a perception in India that a lot of this is again being funded by outside lobbies in order to create these divisions. This is apart from you know what's going on, but and and there is a real pushback on it. So we we've been seeing, uh, for example, now that we've got these uh, trucker protests in Canada, and uh, uh, some some uh, one of the top BJP guys retweeted a quote that Trudeau had tweeted about the farm convoy in exactly the same words, but changing, you know, are we have great concerns about what's happening in India to what's happening in Canada. So there's, you know, kind of a, a, a reappropriation of narrative and pushback on this front. And it goes into um, a, a kind of what, what was particularly interesting in the budget for me was the announcement of, of a digital rupee getting set up. You know, I mean, there's a, there's a whole, this isn't, this isn't kind of a US versus China and which way will India go? India seems to be creating a new space for itself. And if it can create this kind of space for itself, it becomes a unique bridge in the context of, for example, the Quad into a lot of other countries that economically Western economies can't go into. So if you want to uh, displace China from, uh, for example, the Solomon Islands, the, China goes in economically with, very, with low cost things that, that the West can't compete with, but India can compete with. So Indian companies can compete with Chinese companies in places the West can't, and then you can dislodge that economic uh, influence that China is using for strategic and political advantage in those locations, uh, which obviously has a larger security implication across the Indo-Pacific. So India, because of its economic positioning, it can, it can provide the cheap paracetamol that compares to the Chinese products and is more reliable, but the West can't, for example. Same with education, uh, same with forensics, same with cyber, same with, I mean, there's a, across the board. So as India becomes kind of a, a, a stronger uh, in and of itself, it can become a more effective bridge uh, in between those, you know, the, those sorts of economies with the similar values uh, to, to the West, especially in terms of free and open Indo-Pacific and rule of law. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I just, I would put, put that, so India obviously has domestic problems, we all do, uh, just, you know, look at our trekkers, um, but uh, figuring out how to give India the space to be India so that it can expand um, in a way that provides security across the Indo-Pacific, especially economically, is, I, I, personally, I think is quite important. Thank you. India as a bridge country was one of the ideas of this report, uh, India Non-Alignment 2.0, a few years ago, and that was an interesting report, I remember. Tanvi, the last word. I think it does matter in the US, but it doesn't matter as much, to put it bluntly, as strategic and economic imperatives do. And so I think, and, and I say this as somebody who thinks we need to do a lot to bolster democracy here in the US. Um, so, you know, that has affected both the US attention and ability to, to kind of uh, uh, discuss uh, these issues. Um, but I do think where you will, and you could see, uh, and it does make a, an impact is where even for those who consider India important for strategic or economic reasons is, what happens within India? What will be the impact on its ability to play that strategic and economic uh, role? You know, if, uh, as former uh, Navy Chief uh, Arun Prakash said, um, which uh, General Ved Malik, former Army Chief, agreed with, if you have an India that is internally divided and focused at home, that does affect its ability. And we saw this in the 1980s in particular to play that larger role that India would like to play. Um, so I think you do think you do see domestic developments broadly, whether that's economic, political. If that could, if that does have an, have an impact, you will see you do see an impact here. And I think you also see it in terms of American companies' ability to operate. One of the reasons. India has a comparative advantage to China is the rule of law. If they see that as 
you know, not being as transparent as, as it traditionally has been, then you start seeing they're not institutional checks and balances. You will start to see kind of questions about that. Uh, and, you know, especially in boardrooms where they'll say, then we might as well go to China because it's an easier place uh, to do business. Uh, just finally, I think, you know, uh, one place, other place that it does make a difference is, um, and, you know, you can argue about whether anything the U.S. says matters uh, uh, on these questions, uh, but it does mean an uh, expending political capital, which is it has brought an issue where you did see bipartisan support. You saw the diaspora largely uh, uh, kind of unified on India. And you're starting to see cleavages in that that are very much shaped by what is happening at home. So whatever you think about it one way or the other, object to the fact that U.S. On the ground, you are seeing some impact. It doesn't mean it will fundamentally change the US view of India as important, especially in, in, the, in the context of the rise in assertiveness of China. Uh, but it is also not uh, the case that it, it doesn't matter at all. Uh, it is mattering, especially on tactical questions. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you, all of you. It's uh, 3.35 in London, and uh, we have... Uh, done justice to all the questions. Natasha responded to the questions she was asked in the chat. So she also covered uh, a lot of ground. Thank you all. This is part, as you know, of a series of webinars that we are coordinating with Arshpont. Um, and there'll be one more uh, in this series that uh, he will organize, Arsh. Uh, and you'll be, of course, invited to take part in it, uh, probably um, next month or, 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 or on the following month. Thank you again. Thank you very much for this contribution uh, on a moving target, really, uh, a topic that keeps uh, uh, changing uh, one month after the other. Who would have imagined AUKUS changing so much uh, the landscape, for instance, a few months ago? Vignesh, do you have any announcement to make or uh, have I said everything we could say at that stage. We can't hear you. You know, Professor. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I mean, all good. I mean, we just have another event, uh, which is a King's India Institute series, uh, seminar series. Uh, we are launching, we have a book launch of our uh, fellow uh, professor, uh, Kriti Kapila, uh, who's going to launch her book on the 10th February. So uh, you're all, please, uh, we invite you to join that. Uh, thank you very much, otherwise. Yes, Louise, Louise has in the chat um, put the um, link to the coming events. So you, you will know everything about the rich program of King's India Institute events uh, by using these links. Thanks a lot. Good evening. In, thank uh, you. And, and good, good afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.